Let's pray. Yeah, Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. You have overwhelmed us and loved us to the end of ourselves time and time again. And so, Lord, even as we're here together, we sense you. You're real, you're near, you are all consuming. So Lord, I just pray over the moments that you've given us to be together that you would captivate us afresh again. We want to be fully present. Would you arrest our attention and open up our minds to be able to understand the scriptures, even as you did for the disciples. Um, touch our hearts. Soften them so that we might follow wherever it is that you would lead. We have no demands for our own way. You have become the ultimate dream. And what matters to you now matters to us. Yeah. Um, we want you. We want to be completely satisfied in and with and by you. And from there be completely free to do whatever it is that you would ask us to do. To you alone belongs the definition of success for our lives. Um, and we want your smile over the continued place of our obedience. Um, we give you everything again. Um, give us grace to make that as real as we want it to be. We love you, King Jesus. There is nobody like you. And it's in your name we pray. Oh. Amen. 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 Um, if you have a Bible, you can open it up. We'll start in the overall consideration of how God forms the lives of those who in a variety of ways, uh, are going to be leaders. You know, leadership is such an interesting term, right? For real. Um, leadership is such an interesting term. Um, and I think a lot of times we, we try to start with leadership as a goal. Uh, and what I've realized is at times we're trying to turn people into leaders that aren't yet first lovers. Right? Because God turns people into lovers first. And then those that are lovers, he makes them leaders. Uh, because leaders doesn't always become synonymous with lovers. You can find a way into leadership and not necessarily have it been built by the pathway of loving Jesus above all things. Um, and the reason that I even make the distinction is because it is, though it may sound somewhat absurd, it is very important. Um, maybe not in the beginning days, because as we're aware, um, you're not necessarily as aware of how off you are until you get going. Right? Like, time and distance begins to reveal, like, what we thought was wisdom, what we thought was right, what we thought was the way in the beginning days. Um, just like charting a course for a ship, charting a course for a plane, charting a course when you take off driving. Right? If you're a few points off in the beginning, it's not as noticeable as when you get a thousand miles out. Yeah. When you get a thousand miles out, and you're like, whoa, like, oh, okay, th th this is not necessarily where I wanted to end up. Um, so I make the distinction in the beginning. God is after lovers. Right? He's after completely overwhelming people's lives, um, undoing them and unraveling them from the love of self, bringing them into an ultimate love for his son, Meaning, above all things, I love Jesus more than I love leadership. Right? I love Jesus more than I love functioning in church ministry. I love Jesus more than I love the thought of my own influence. 
more than I love the thought of my own gifting, more than I love the thought of being connected to other leaders and all the different social circles and different things that might be opened up to me because now I'm a leader, because now I'm leading a work, planting a work, involved in a certain arena, uh, and it's inevitable. That's going to create unique opportunities and connections. But I love Jesus more than I love those things, right? Uh, and so turning people into lovers is paramount because this is the church planting strategy that I find that the scriptures prescribes. Paul's church planting strategy was very simple. Follow me. That was his church planting strategy. That's what Paul had to offer. Right? He wasn't coming in with some model that you could mass produce uh, because it's difficult to mass produce people's lives that are whole, healthy, and vibrantly powerful in God. That's not as easy to mass produce as teaching people how to perform church services in a variety of contexts. It's easier to teach somebody how to host a church service in a living room, how to host a church service in an auditorium, how to create an order of service, a flow of events, even to be a event hosting company. That's a whole lot easier to do than to try to teach somebody how to actually be whole and healthy and vibrant, meaning alive and intimately connected to God and then powerful out of a place of intimate connection. That is much harder to accomplish than just teaching people how to host events. Which is why Paul didn't teach people how to host events. He said, look at my life. That's where leadership begins. It starts with your real life. Not, not the imagery, not the facade, right? Not the social media filter driven generation that we live in. It starts with who you really are and your real quality of life in God. Because God's reproducible element in the earth is people. Come on. Like that's what he's using to reproduce. And God is very interested in the quality of life that men live. And I use men as a universal term to include men and women. Yes, I endorse women in ministry. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm using the word men, right, as Paul used it all throughout Romans in the term Adam, meaning the first version of humanity. So God is interested in the quality of life that men live. Um, how could we come to that conclusion? God became a man himself and lived the quality of life that he desired for all men to be able to experience. Right? So God is not only interested, but he is fully invested into men and the quality of life that men are able to live. And men now become the reproducible element that God is using to build, to establish, and to advance his purposes in the earth. It's coming through the lives of real people that are really connected to God, that are living in the real quality of life that God desires, and then who really bear influence. And God would call that a pattern, which is what Paul saw as himself. Right? Which is why Paul could say something like what he said in a variety of places. 1 Corinthians 4.16, imitate me as I imitate him. Which means Paul had a bigger vision than himself. He said, imitate me as I'm imitating someone else. But not just someone else, meaning that in our rock star driven generation where we find people that we tend to cling to, be identified with, you know, so and so who's leading this movement, this face of the franchise, this brand, this platform. No, no, no. Paul's vision was not necessarily just any individual person who would become popular in his moment of history. Paul had a clear vision of Jesus and his vision for his own life and the transformation of his own life was held up against the measuring rod, which was Christ himself. Right? And that's important because we can feel however we want to feel about ourselves, depending on who we're looking at. Yeah. Right? And if I, if I want to feel good about myself, regardless of how I'm actually doing, I can just find someone to look at and then to compare myself to that's going to make me feel better about how I'm actually doing and where it is that I actually am. 
And at times when I want to feel challenged, I'm going to look to someone that I know is going to challenge me because in my own estimation or evaluation, they seem to be a little bit beyond me, meaning my current place as I'm tracking with God of transformation or maturity in my own life. Uh, but Paul had a vision of someone greater than himself, bigger than himself, and that person was Jesus. Right? So, so we have to have a clear vision of Jesus to be able to understand what it is that God is after. Because God is forming people into the image of his son. You can restfully be confident that that is God's goal. To conform people to the image of Jesus. That's the Romans 8.29 predestination language. For God has a predestined goal for those that come to believe, those that love his son. His goal is to make them more like Jesus. Right? That's the goal. A people that are more like Jesus and maturing into the image of his son. That's what it's all about. Right? So, so that sounds fundamental. And it's not even that it's necessarily complicated. It's just complex in the way that God works that out over time to mature us in a variety of ways, especially when our hearts desire leadership, which is not a bad thing. That's what Paul told Timothy as he was writing. That's in 1 Timothy. If any man desires, if any man aspires towards leadership, it's a noble desire. It's right. In some instances, it's very healthy. It's not wrong. It shouldn't be looked down upon. Um, there has to be desire. That there has to be something on the inside of a want to. Um, and we've all experienced this in a variety of ways. So sometimes you acknowledge something for someone and you want it for them more than they want it for themselves. That's tough. Right? That, that's difficult to, to work with. Um, but this is not what Paul is communicating to Timothy. He says, if any man desires, meaning, meaning there's something on the inside, a longing. There's desire. There's a want to. So in the consideration of leadership, Paul understood that he was a pattern because God had done something in his life. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Right? And again, this is very healthy, and it's something that we all are going to have to own up to time and time and time again as God is transforming us. Paul is saying, I realize I am not what I used to be. Right? I, I love, um, I, Bill Johnson is the one that says it. Uh, he says, there's going to have to come a point in all of our own journeying with God where we believe in our own conversion. Yeah. Wow. Like, at some point, we're going to have to actually believe. God has done something in me. He's changed me. He's made me a brand new person. I am not what I used to be. I'm a new version of human. I am a new creation. I house a divine life by his spirit. He's given me a new nature. I am radically reconfigured in every possible way. The old man is gone. The old appetites are dead. I'm no longer alive to sin. That has been baptized, crucified, me to the cross, the love of the world, it's all gone. I am now alive to God in union with his son by the power of the spirit, and this is my life. And I actually believe that. It's not just a biblical amen, I actually believe that. Right now, now theologically we may know that we're supposed to amen that, but practically, experientially, yes. in our journeying with God, we are going to have to believe that more and more and more and more. And this is the language that Paul uses. I am what I am by God's grace. It's not by my own doing. It's not because I'm smart enough. I had enough money. I had the right religious upbringing. None of these things actually qualified me for the transformation that God really did in my life. It was all him. It was all his spirit. I saw his son and gave him the yes he wanted. Wow. He changed my whole life. And now I actually believe that. Wow. And why do I believe that? Because I recognize I am a radically different thing than what I used to be. Right? So, so that's entering the door of kingdom life. Mm -hmm. 
I am a radically different thing than what I used to be. And now the ongoing cultivation of that we would call discipleship. Right? Like conditioning my life to live consistently in the reality of what I say I believe. Retraining my appetites that are connected to this new nature to be satisfied the way that God says is right. That's what we would call discipleship. Because with all of our old appetites, we spent a lot of time learning how to satisfy them in particular ways. But now that old man is dead. He's gone. Those lustful cravings, which is why Paul can say in Galatians 5, we're a spirit people. And if we live by the spirit and walk in the spirit, we don't have to gratify or satisfy <coughs> the lustful cravings of the flesh. Not just a sexual connotation, even though that's implied, but the overall demands of this flesh wanting to be satisfied its own way. Mm -hmm. That's not you anymore. We have the spirit. And now we're journeying in God to learn how to grow up. That's discipleship in the retraining of those appetites. I can't satisfy my new nature the way that my old man used to demand. I'm a new thing. So we would call that process discipleship, learning how to satisfy these new appetites, God's way, not our own way, learning how to reorient my whole life to consistently live in the power and the reality of what it is that I know how to amen. We would call that discipleship. And so Paul recognized that he was something wildly different than the religious zealot that he used to be. But consider his life. The best of the training, powerful order, but also persecuting believers, ripping them out of their homes, jailing them and executing them in the streets. Like, Paul is different now. <laughs> He's not the same dude that he used to be. And he realizes it's by God's grace. And now he considers his life to be what he says is a pattern. In Philippians 3, he tells them, walk according to those who live by the pattern that you saw in us. Paul knew he had a way of life that God endorsed. It wasn't just what he saw himself to be, but it was everything about the way that he set his life up. Wow. That he knew that God agreed with, that God amen meant to consider God amens my way of life. That when heaven looks at my life, it says, yes, that makes sense. Wow. Amen. I agree with that. Good. I'm going to bring as many people around you to be influenced by that because I can sign off on that. I can amen that. Oh Everything about the way that you've set your life up, I want everyone possible to get as close to you as they can to learn your way of life. Paul saw himself as a pattern. A pattern is something that gets laid down for the sake of reproduction. Wow. You establish a pattern so that you can then multiply, so that you can then reproduce. But Paul just didn't have some kind of church system, something that he was manufacturing outside of his own quality of life. He understood that it was his own life his own quality of life in God, and then the way that he set his life up in God, that God actually believed in, and then wanted to rally others around to glean from, learn from, and be influenced by. Which is why he can say, you know the way that I lived. This was Philippians 3. He says, find those who lived the way that I lived, and continue to walk with them, learn from them. That's Philippians 3. Philippians 4.9, he says, everything that you've heard and received, learned and seen in me. Do these things, and God will be with you, and will be able to fulfill his purposes with you. That, that's, I'm just going to be honest, that's super wild. Yeah. Like, watch my life, follow me around every day. Do the best that you can possibly do to set up everything about the way that you do life, to mirror, to mimic, to be modeled by what you saw me model or demonstrate as I did life with you day by day. 
do the best that you possibly can to learn from the way that I've set my life up. And not only will God be with you, but he's going to be able to fulfill all of his purposes for you. That's crazy. That's insane. I mean, it, it sounds super wild. So Paul must have understood something that maybe we've not yet connected with to be as confident in the way that Paul was saying what he was saying. Um, but this is the goal that we all should be leaning into to actually consider my real life and the quality of life that I am experiencing in God and the way that I've set my life up day by day. Uh, because we've all heard it best. Uh, we are not what we think about doing. We are the byproduct of the things we actually do. Right? That, that's just, it's an honest evaluation. We are not what we hope to be. We are not what we think about doing. We are the consequence of what we have been doing. Right? Because there are certain principles that God will not compromise about himself. That which soever a man sows, that will he also reap. So sowing and reaping is a principle that God has bound himself to. And so we are the reaping of that which we've been sowing historically. Right? That, that's, that's honest to say where we all are. And so Paul was communicating, right? Everything that you see me do, learn from me. This is what he tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16. Watch your life and your teaching. For in that, you will be able to preserve your own life and the salvation of those who are found in your hearing. Because that's the idea, is that you don't teach outside of your real life. Wow. Which is why life comes first. Watch your life and your teaching. Because that's where conflict gets created. Um, when you hear people say things that you then don't get to see actually embodied or fleshed out in their real life. Right? There's only so much time that we're able to deal with that before we're unable to reconcile the distance between the two points. Right? Because it's not, um, listen to me, that Paul said, or that even Jesus said. Jesus said, follow me. Right? Which is what Paul said, follow me. Because the idea is what you hear from me is going to be in alignment. It's going to be beautifully synergized. There's going to be harmony. You're never going to find a disunity out of what I know to say and how I know to live. Right? I love the A.W. Tozer statement. Um, you let me live with a man long enough, and I'll tell you what he believes. Yeah. Because the idea is the only things we actually believe are the things that we actually live. And so Paul tells Timothy, watch your life, your life, and then your teaching. Because whatever you have to say is always best heard and received in the context of your real life. Right? Your, your message is always best heard in the context of your life. Right? Which is why it's easier, especially in leadership, to create this platform influence where it's built by distance. Mm -hmm. Meaning, only come and listen to me, and then I keep everybody out of my life so that there's never any conflict with how you see me living and the things that you hear me saying. And I want you to appreciate the things that I have to say, but I simultaneously have to keep you away from the way that I actually live. Because if you saw the way that I actually lived, it may make it difficult to receive the things that I have to say. Right? And that's challenging over time. And we can use whatever excuses we want to for that. Uh, well, you have to protect the anointing, so don't let people get close to you. Oh, my. Oh, my. Nice. Good one. Good one. Um, familiarity breeds contempt. Right? The closer people get to you, the more familiar they become with you. They won't honor you anymore. They're, they're going to become contemptible. Right? Like they, they won't honor you. They won't allow you the influence anymore. Let, let, me, let me suggest this. Right? 
if you get super close to me, I'll just use myself as an example. If you get super close to me, and what you see and experience no longer brings you to the place where you've determined you're willing to honor me, right? What you've seen and experienced is not honorable then who's the one that has the problem? Wow. I'm the one that has the problem. Because if you get close to me, and it lowers the honor that you have for me. If you get super in close in proximity to me, meaning I open up my life, and you have a vantage point to be able to watch me live, and it doesn't increase the honor, then I'm the one that has the issue. And there's only so long if I'm not living in an honorable way that I can shift the blame to others. Right? Where I know how to say the right thing, but because I'm not actually living the right way, it's not creating the honor that if I just set up shop over here and created distance and just wowed everybody with presentation or platform influence, if I just kept it that way, then that alone would create a certain idea about who I am, because that's usually the way that we do it. Right? Somebody gets influence, they can articulate, they can flow with gifts, they move in power and it generates th this sort of attention or this attraction to the way that God uses them. We automatically begin to think, well, if God is with them that way, then the rest of their life must be set up this way. As if to assume that God's private endorsement of our life is only and always the thing that creates public influence for us. That's not true, by the way. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of other ways to get public influence and leadership that's not always directly connected to a personal, private development and authorization of God's endorsement on your life. There's a whole bunch of other ways to do it. Right? A lot of other ways to do it. Which is why I say leadership is such an interesting word. Um, because there's a lot of ways to become a leader that doesn't necessarily follow the biblical prescription. The biblical prescription is what Paul told Timothy. Watch your life first. Do you have a life that is reproducible in God? That's the question of leadership. Uh, in, the, in the community, the kingdom family that we've been planting now for six plus years, that's been our question from day one, which is why it's slowed down our planting efforts. Um, I could not possibly look at you and honestly tell you I'm going to plant 50 house churches this year. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I, I would want to bust out laughing <laughs> if somebody was sincerely... You, you can be as sincere as you want to be and still be wrong. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can think whatever you want to think and, and still be wrong. Right? Just because you're sincere doesn't mean you're right. Yeah. <laughs> There's all types of stuff that we're really sincere about Wow. That Jesus doesn't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. true. Right? Like, Martha gets super mad because Mary's not doing anything. And she's bombarding Jesus, like, do something about this. And he's like, no. You're all worked up about this. You're not right. I don't even agree with you. I'm not taking this away from her. Mm -hmm. Like, so you can be super sincere and still be super wrong. Right? And so it's slowed down our planting efforts. Because we're not planting according to systems. Yeah. Wow. We're planting according to real people yeah. that God actually matures over yeah. time that become reproducible. That we can look at other people and say, follow him as he follows Christ. Follow her as she follows Christ. They have become a pattern that we can amen. We are endorsing their way of life in God. And if you can get as close to them as you can and be influenced by them in whatever possible way, that would be the best thing that could happen for you because God believes in the way that they do life in him. That's our church planting strategy. Yeah, come on. And when you make it about real people, it tends to usually not be able to move as fast as the other church planting strategies that are out there. Mm -hmm. Because you're not wowing people with events. 
You're not wowing people with big time names. You're not wowing people with all of these subcategories, compartments, or ministries. You're not wowing people with a mission and a vision statement that's some catchphrase or fancy language that you can rally people around. No, no, none of these things. Come on. We're rallying people around actual transformation that's happening to real people in real time by the grace of God that is wildly reconfiguring old versions of humans into new creations and we are setting their life up to live mature and powerful in God and that takes time Um, you can't hit the fast forward button on somebody's maturity now you can move according to God's timetable but, but you can't fast forward the timetable right but what I mean by that is um, following the Lord's leadership Right, if we use the children of Israel as an example, back in Exodus, following the Lord's leadership, which is the best leadership, right? His leadership is best. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yahweh is the best way, right? So His leadership is best. Following His leadership um, for the children of Israel was an eleven-day journey. You want to do it your own way? You think you know better than I do? You want to buck my leadership? You want to lead your own life? You want to try to handle? your own scenarios and navigate things in what you think is the best interest or wisdom? Okay, great. In the 40th year... (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, like God's leadership creates an 11-day journey. Our leadership creates a 40-day journey or a 40-year journey. Right? So great leadership tends to shorten the distance between any two given points. Is what great leadership should be doing. Right? Great leadership should be shortening the distance between any two given points. I know the way. Follow me. It doesn't have to take you 40 years. Right? Trust in his leadership. Say yes to him and continually give yourself to him in the process that he's laid out for your own journey, your own maturity. Because the speed of your own maturity happens at the strength of your yes to God. One more time. The the speed of your maturity happens at the strength of your yes. Because yes to yes is what creates history in God. that's, That's how we get history in God. We say yes. And we say it over and over and over and over again. And from yes to yes, we're creating history. But that, that's, that's what it actually looks like. It's the surrendered life. Because again, if we're not surrendering to the Lord and following his leadership for our personal development, then what we are doing is we're creating ideas of what we think a leader looks like, of what we think somebody who's mature in God looks like. And usually what we're doing is defining terms that Jesus didn't actually lay out himself. Mm. Right? And we can easily identify that by simply asking ourselves, what does someone who is mature in God actually look like? We all immediately come to certain conclusions. Oh, well, um, they speak well. They, they prophesy. Uh, well, they can pray the paint off the walls. Uh, well, like... They, they flow in gifts. They this, they that, they whatever. None of those things find any of the maturity charts that are laid out in the scriptures. That's cool. None of those things. Right? Because God has an idea of what a fully developed um, or a mature image of his son actually looks like. Right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a great place to begin. Right? Jesus lays it all out. Like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Spiritual bankruptcy. I need you, Lord, every day, every moment. Right? Never graduating from dependency is the idea. Right? Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Right? Blessed are those who mourn. Right? Like, like, these are the qualities of maturity that God is looking to actually forge into a people that have surrendered their lives to his son. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Right? Those who can rejoice under persecution and duress, when people hate you, when people accuse you, 
right? Like, like all of these things, radical joy, giving, fasting, prayer, like these are things, Matthew 5 and 6, right? When you get to Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, but like, and obviously the end one, or the ninth one being self-control, right? Like, like these are things that are defining qualities of maturity in God. And so the reason I say if we're not surrendering to his leadership, then at times we're creating our own idea of what a leader looks like. And in most instances, it's being formed by a lot of church history and opinions that have come out of that crowd. It's being formed culturally, right? Or even worse than that, it's just our own ideas of what we think we want to be about. And then we go about trying to build the idea of our own life in what we think a mature leader actually looks like. Um, when in some instances, you can successfully arrive at what your idea was and still be a long ways off from what the Bible actually prescribes someone who's mature in God really looks like. But that's why we have to start with the idea of real people's lives becoming reproducible. Because you are the reproducible element that God is looking to use. Your life in God is what God is looking to manufacture in others. And as leaders, we bear a relational influence to influence others unto a certain way of life in God, right? Which we're not like lording leadership over others. As a matter of fact, the Bible prescribes a very different paradigm, right? Ephesians 4 is gifts go low and they serve from the lowest place so that saints can go high, come alive, be awakened and be activated unto a full life in God and a life of ministry. Right? That's the model for Ephesians 4, which means as leaders, we're not looking for high place. We're looking for the lowest possible places so that we can serve even unto the laying down of our own lives. Because yeah. God tends to wield power through relational influence different than we do. Right? God's style of leadership is a king that carries a cross. That's his style of leadership. Kings carry crosses. That's his style of leadership, is being self-sacrificing at all times, meaning always giving of himself, self-sacrificing, not self-serving, right, which be, would be the exact opposite, meaning always thinking of me, always doing everything I can so that everything else in my life is serving the desires that I have, Meaning that I'm always trying to set things up to where my personal desires become central and then everything else is going to orbit around and find a hinge point or a pivoting to be able to give me the things that I think I want most. God is the exact opposite. He is always self-sacrificing. Always. Which is why he can be trusted with all power and authority. Right? Sometimes it's the mercy of God that we don't have the power that we're crying out for. Yeah. <laughs> because we would not walk it out or wield it the way that he would. He can be trusted with all power and authority because he's not self-consumed. He's not self-absorbed. He's not so into himself that he's always trying to serve himself with the power that he has. <laughs> he's always self-sacrificing. Giving of himself even unto the laying down of his own life in order to better the lives of others. That's who God is, and that's why he can be trusted with all power. But in the consideration of leaders, we have to, first off, have a clear vision of who he is, which is where Paul started. Follow me as I follow him. We have to have a clear vision of who he is so that we can understand he's not like us, which then brings us to the real understanding that because he's not like us, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, he's holy. He's not like us. 
that we can then begin to be conformed into his image so that we can handle power and wield it through relational influence the way that he does, which is being self-sacrificing, always looking to lay down our lives through serving in the lowest possible places for the end desire of bettering the lives of others. That's who God is. And we find that perfectly embodied in the person of Jesus. Right, Paul in Philippians 2, God humbled himself to become a man. Then even as a man, God humbled himself and chose to become a servant. And then even after becoming a man and becoming a servant, God humbled himself again and chose to lay down his own life. And not only did he choose to lay down his own life, which is humbling to even think about, he did it in the most humbling possible way. To be executed publicly as a criminal being mocked by people and powers. Wow. That's the wisdom of the cross. Wow. I will go to the lowest place and serve in the most powerful, profound way. Why? In order to better the lives of my enemies and executioners. You're not like me at all, at all. Right? It, it just takes a few comments in the Facebook group sometimes to get me totally unnerved to the point where like laying my life down for somebody is no longer at the forefront. Like I'm trying to lay somebody else's life down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, like you're not like me. Like who is this king of glory who can handle all power and authority because he's the good shepherd and he leads well. And following his leadership and our own maturity journey looks like over time, as we continue to say yes to him, he makes us more like him. Um, which is why we can't disqualify any yes that God asks for. <clears throat> right? This is super important in the conversation of leadership. I've learned um, in 20 years of walking with the Lord. Uh, which may not sound like a whole lot, uh, but it's a whole lot for me. Um, in 20 years of walking with Jesus, I've learned that he cares about every yes that he asks for. Yeah. Wow. And there is no yes that he asks for that is not directly connected to his purposes for your life. Wow. Um, we, we spend a lot of time trying to evaluate yeses. And then the yeses that we've determined are important, we give them our attention, wow. right? Because we're, we're always trying to figure things out from our side, right? Like, all right, like, man, I've got, like, man, I'm gripped with vision. Like, my heart is on fire. Like, I know God wants to do something. I know he wants to use me. I want him to use me. Like, okay, great. Uh, which yes is going to put me there? <laughs> right? Like, let's just, let's just keep it real. Like, like that's, that's how we spend the majority of our time whether intentionally or unintentionally, which means we are evaluating yeses based off of our perspective of how God creates processes. Wow. Oh, wow. But he's not like us. And he at times is going to ask for a yes that is out in left field somewhere. Forget left field. Like you've hopped the fence. You're <laughs> up in the top of the bleachers. You know what I mean? Like you, you, there's no way at all that you could even think how this yes would be directly connected to this purpose over here. Wow. Wow. Right? Like, um, it, it looks something like this sometimes, right? If you consider uh, journeying through the scriptures, right? <laughs> Daniel and his guys, they fast for three years on vegetables and water. I know we've got probably some Bible scholars. No, it was only 10 days. No, it wasn't 10 days. Their schooling was three years. They went for schooling for three years and then entered into the king's service full time. After 10 days, Aspenaz evaluated them, and then it says he let them continue for the rest of their school. So three years, Daniel 1.8, he resolved. There was a personal commitment to God. Now, I believe the Lord asked him for something, right? Like, he gave a yes to the Lord. I will not defile myself by the delicacies of the king's table. Cool. Three years of vegetables and water, Right? Um, which, th that's why it's Daniel fasting, 
because we find Daniel fasting three times in the book of Daniel. Chapter 1, chapter 9, chapter 10. Um, chapter 10, three weeks, right? Which is why the most commercialized version is the 21 days that we find in chapter 10. Why? Because 21 days is easier than three years. <laughs> like, why did everybody rally around the 21 day version? Because <laughs> three years is harder than 21 days. You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> um, three years costs you more. That's a heavier yes. Um, but out of that three, and then chapter nine, we get no details, which I love. Um, but chapter one, three years. But what happens? In verse 17, and unto Daniel and his three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get wisdom, learning, insight, and understanding. And unto Daniel, he gets the ability to interpret dreams and visions of all kinds and to solve riddles and mysteries. Three years of vegetable and water produced a spiritual impartation that was seeming to have no direct connection point mm -hmm. to what it was that God was asking for. Right? In, in, in our ideas, it's like, well, bro, if I just wanted to know, like, you know, about dream interpretation and stuff like that, like, I could just read Brian Darren books, bro. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I could just listen to podcasts. Like, I could watch YouTube videos. That's not what the Lord asked them for. And it's not just because podcasts and YouTube wasn't created back then. <laughs> God at times has a way of confounding our wisdom and asking us to give him a yes that does not seem to produce the desired results that we're after. But God has a way to make sure that we're more interested in surrendering to him than we are the idea of what it is that we want from him. Because that's where the disconnect gets created. I'll say yes to you if it leads where I want. Mm. Right? I'll say yes to you if it brings me closer to the things that I feel like I'm pursuing. Mm. Well, I'm going to find out if you're really interested in saying yes to me and loving me the way that I'm asking you to. I'm going to ask you for something that seems to have no connection point at all mm. to what you feel passionate about, to the things that you think you're pursuing. Um, right? Three years of vegetables and water, th that's a big time request. Right? Like, like for real. But the return on that investment lasted for the entirety of Daniel's life. But any business-minded people in the room, you give me three years, I'll give you 70 years. That's an amazing return. Right? Daniel was a teenager in the beginning days. By the time you get to Darius, many believe he's in his 90s. That's eight decades of Daniel's life that we find in the book under Babylon. Multiple kings, but he's thriving in God. And what he owned, he owned. Meaning it was his. Yeah. It wasn't only active when he was fasting. He said yes for three years and God deposited into, into him. He imparted to him something that now became a permanent part of who he was. Right? Samuel, for instance, grows up in presence. The Lord begins to call him. Um, yes, Lord, here I am. Your servant is listening. Um, we know because Samuel 1.19, I believe it is, that says, and all of the region knew that God had established Samuel as a prophet and that none of his words over the remainder of his life ever fell to the ground. That sounds amazing. Right? Like That, that sounds amazing. Um, to be known throughout the region, that God has done something in my life, and it's real, it's authentic. And that none of my words ever fell to the ground. Authenticity. Right? Like, Samuel was never off. It wasn't like, oh, bro, I missed it. Sorry. He was never off. That's verse 19. But how did he get there? God asked him for a yes. And it started like this. Go deliver this word to Eli. I'm going to ask you to rebuke the man that raised you and to confront him on his corruption and his wickedness. He knows that his two sons are in compromise, Hophni and Phinehas. They're worthless. That's what chapter 2 tells us. They're worthless. Eli knows it, and he's overlooking it. I'm going to ask you to go rebuke him and give him this word. So, so the hinge point of throughout the whole region being known as an authentic, authorized prophet, and none of your words ever falling to the ground, 
the hinge point is giving God this yes. Go rebuke that man. It's like, I don't know if I really want to do that. I, I don't know if I really want to do that. Okay, that's cool. This is the way. <laughs> you give me this yes, this is how we're going to break into this process and outcome. We don't get to determine the yes that connects us to God's purpose. We just get to determine if he's going to get the yes from us that he's asking for. And this is why I say history with God is one yes to the next yes. Because I think at times we spend too much time evaluating yeses, trying to qualify whether they're worth it or not. Where I would submit to you every yes that he asks for is worth it. Every yes that he comes to you for is connected to his purpose. Any yes that he himself is desiring from you is a yes that we should conclude is a big deal. <laughs> Every yes. And he asks for all kinds of yeses, right? John the Baptist had a yes that uh, affected his wardrobe and his diet. <laughs> Camel skin and locusts and honey. I was like, no, 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 I'm not ready for the Lord to speak to me about the way that I eat. He wouldn't care about those types of things. Well, that's our opinion. The Bible tells us something a little different. <laughs> right? Um, and that's why out of the idea of God actually creating influence with our life, um, those who bear influence are those that yield to influence. That's where kingdom influence comes from. The Roman centurion said to Jesus, I recognize that you are a man that is under authority. Because I too am a man that is under authority. I tell this one to go and he goes. I tell this one to do this and he does this. I see that in you. Because Jesus said, I don't even have to go with you. I can just say the word. Right? And he says, I realize by looking at you that you are under authority. And that's where your authority actually comes from. The idea of kingdom influence is we bear authority because we are yielded to authority. Yes. Peter creates the idea in 1 Peter 5 that we are the under shepherds to the chief shepherd. That we don't have a people, Jesus has a people. We don't have a church, he has a church. Yeah. And in the role of leadership, it's unto laying down our lives continually out of a beautiful place of laying down our life and surrendering to him. He then puts influence on us in a relational way so that others that get close to us watch us live and by what we model then want to do the same. Right? We don't have leadership because we just claim to be more authoritative than the next person. Right? This, is, this is bogus. This is nonsense. Right? This is worldly in nature, which is what Jesus contrasted. Worldly leadership? He said, don't be like the worldly rulers, who out of their positions, their titles, their platforms, lord it over those that they lead and try to domineer them from a top-down structure. He said, don't be like those guys. But let the greatest among you be the least. Let him serve. Let him find a way to constantly give of himself for the bettering of the lives of others, even unto the laying down of his life, which again is the wisdom of the cross. I will lay my life down in love with joy to better the lives of my enemies and my executioners. Here I am. This is the idea of who God is. All right, so as God is growing our lives, we should be able to find the metrics of maturity that the scriptures prescribe and then evaluate that in our own journey over time. Because all of our lives are observable and measurable. Which is why Paul tells Timothy, watch your life. Because it's observable. The way that you live around others, people get to see it. That's what I mean by observable. Right? We don't just get to hide out on a mountaintop somewhere. I mean, that'd be cool. Or like, you know, retreat away to a cabin and then only come out, you know, to like to glow and speak to the masses and then go back. Like, no, that's not the way it works. Our life gets put down 
in real time. Mm. So that we have to actually live in relationship to other people yeah. and circumstances. Because those are the two things that best evidence yeah. our maturity in God. That's good. How we relate to others and how we relate to circumstances. Mm. That's good. But those are the two things that best give evidence wow. to either the depth of transformation or the lack of transformation. And either one of those, we have to own. <laughs> like, we have to own it. You know what I mean? But that's part of making your real life and the quality of your real life the goal. Where you're no longer ignoring these things because you've created your own ideas of what a leader should look like, and therefore a lack of transformation is being satisfied by these other ideals. Mm. Well, bro, I preach well, so I don't have to pay attention to the way I treat my wife. <laughs> Like, bro, like, have you ever seen me float? Like, are you serious? Like, who cares how I talk to my wife? Like, bro, I can preach. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, we create all of these other buffers to make distance from our real life and the quality of it. Having to own who we are in God because we've now put all of the responsibility on these external things that we know how to do and not who we actually are. Right? This is the difference. So how we relate to others and how we relate to circumstances give evidence. And it's observable. People get to see it. They get to see how you handle life. They get to see how you live life. And what you are when life happens to you. What you are when that person accuses you and betrays you. What you are when you lose your job and all of a sudden you end up in financial crisis. What you are when, uh, whatever, you, you plug in whatever scenario you want to. When life happens to you circumstantially or relationally, these two things give evidence. It creates what, um, what Jesus would say in Acts 1, a witness. Um, and it's, it's observable. And then the second part of that is it's measurable. And, and I've already said what that means. It just means we can determine how mature we are. Because it's measurable. Mm. Those things are actually measurable. It's not some abstract, like, our own ideals where it becomes relative. No, no, it's not relative at all. It's not relative whatsoever. Like, we don't get to come up with what a mature believer in God looks like. He's already told us. Like, he's already told us. So we don't get to create our own ideas. No, no, he's trying to do the Jesus thing. He's not trying to do our own ideas and our own personal thing. He's trying to do the Jesus thing. And he's already told us what that looks like. Which is why I said Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Galatians 5, um, 2 Peter 1. All of these are great places to find a growth track, a maturity chart. Like the process, the trajectory of being conformed to the image of Jesus. He's already told us what the goal is. So at times it's silly to create sub-goals that satisfy our desires at times which are creating distance from a lack of transformation. I just have to learn how to renegotiate the terms. Wow. Oh, well, you can't really be serious about that mercy stuff. Like, there's no way. Like, like I think other things are more important than that. We don't get to determine that. Really, we don't get to determine that. It doesn't matter how dynamic someone is. It doesn't matter what type of charisma, what type of likability. It doesn't matter the demographic. Well, we got to make sure that our leadership team is consists of a certain demographic because of the people we're trying to reach. This is all garbage. Come on. For real. Like, this is not Bible. And a lot of times we don't see Bible results because we're not using Bible as a building strategy. When you use Bible, you get what the Bible actually prescribes. So we want to use Bible. Wow. And we want to actually evaluate the maturity of people's lives against what the Bible is saying a mature believer in God actually looks like. But you don't understand, Michael, like everybody likes them. And like if we make them a leader, then we'll have a lot of people show up. Mm -hmm. I could give a rip how many yeah. people like you. Likeability is not on the chart. <laughs> Of what Paul told Timothy. Let's go. 
Paul gave Timothy a list. He gave Titus a list of qualities or ingredients that you could not fake long enough. Well, if a man doesn't have, doesn't have his own house in order, what makes you think he's going to be able to manage the house of God? 1 Timothy 3, 5. Oh, you mean my house has to be in order? Like, oh, are you serious? Well, a man has to have a good report with outsiders if he wants to be a leader. Outsiders. So these just aren't like your Christian friends, right? Like these aren't the people that you can like, well, they get me. You know what I'm saying? They know my heart. So, so they've created exemptions and they make excuses for me in places where I'm not as jealous to be transformed in certain ways that God is jealous for. Because I've satisfied my lack of transformation with other ideas of what I think a leader looks like. No, no, no. That, that, that's trash, right? Like a good report with outsiders means we're going to follow you around and we're going to find out where you spend the most time. So I'm going to go to the coffee shops that you go to. I'm going to go to the grocery store that you shop at. I'm going to go to your job, and I'm going to ask your coworkers and your boss what you're actually like. Right? You spend 40, 50 hours a week there? That's a great amount of time. Who are you on the job? You know what I'm saying? Like, a good report with outsiders. Like, a man must be hospitable. Because at times, if we're unwilling to open up our home, it means there's places in our heart we're unwilling to open. Right? When the heart is open, the house can be yeah, open. Because wow, there's there nothing is. I'm looking to hide. Mm -hmm. Who I am at home is who I am. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like the list of qualities that Paul gave Timothy for leadership are things you can't fake. A man can't be given over to fits of rage. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Um, a man can't be self-willed, which is where he begins, which means 90% of the current leaders are disqualified. Wow. You can't be self-willed. You have to be surrendered. Oh. You can't live by your own ambition or your own ministry dreams and goals. You can't live with the thought of building something for yourself and how you could benefit from that. Your own influence, your own platform, financing your own ministry objectives and your life in God, all of that is trash. If you're self-willed, it means you are self-willed, which means you're not following your leading in the conversation. You are the starting point. You're initiating rather than surrendering. Right? A man can't be self-willed is where Paul begins in the consideration of leadership. Like, bro, I'm glad that you have a lot of dreams and goals. And I'm glad you got a lot of ways that you can make that happen. Um, but your heart's not soft. Wow. And hard hearts don't follow well. Oh. Dang. Um, the softer our heart is, the greater the grace we can receive to offload our own agenda. Right? That those are the ones that are meek. They're powerful because they realize they can do all things, but they're only here to do the thing that he's asking them to do. Let's go. Th that, that's meekness. I can do anything, but I have no agenda. My agenda has become his agenda. That's meekness. I have the power to produce, but I also have enough power that I don't have to prove it. Like, my life is not defined by me being able to produce a bunch of stuff to prove that I am who I say I am. Right? That's what they wanted with Jesus. Like, bro, we beat the drum and you won't dance. We set the table and you won't eat with us. But, like, what's the deal? Like, we can't make you do what we want you to do. It's because I'm not here to do what you want me to do. That's not actually what I'm even about. I don't really have a care for what it is that you want me to do. I delight to do my Father's will. And I'm completely given over to His agenda. And I have enough power to do whatever I want, but I also have enough power to yield all of my wants and desires. At the end of the day, your will be done and not mine. Right? He's tested in the garden. I know that there's other ways. But at the end of the conversation, even at times if I have to wrestle it out and bleed for it, at the end of the conversation, your will be done. Don't let this cup pass from me. Right? That, that's meekness. To be powerful and without agenda. To not have to prove who we are. Right? So, so all of that we find in the qualifications of what Paul lists for leadership. And as I said moments ago, that's what's slowed down our church planting efforts. I couldn't possibly as quickly reproduce churches the way at times that uh, in the beginning days it was like, oh yeah, we're after this boy. Like, <laughs> like man, we got a team. Like, we're about to be about this life. Like, God's going to make it happen. He's going to blow this thing up. Man, like, we're going to have all these house No, we're actually not. 
Wow. Because once you put people into the equation, right. yeah. stuff slows down and it gets really hard because I can't force someone to say yes to God quicker than they want to. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and so if God grows people at the speed and the strength of their yes, they're not saying yes to me. Mm -hmm. Or if they are, they're not actually growing in him. Right? Like I don't want them to give me a yes that they're not giving to him. Right? Francis Chan, in his last book, um, To the Seven Churches, he says, No amount of lifting your voice will bring someone to a place of surrender if they're unwilling to yield to his voice. You can yell at them. You can condemn them. You can try to guilt them. <laughs> but no amount of yelling, condemning, guilting can bring someone to saying yes to you that is not equally willing to say yes to God. Mm -hmm. Right? So things slow down when people actually have to walk with the Lord for themselves. And that becomes my church planting strategy. Well, I have to wait for you to become mature in God to where I can trust your influence in other people's lives and then tell other people confidently, get as close to him as you can and let him influence you. Wow. That's going to take real time, yeah. right? Because there's going to be certain factors that I'm looking for if you are going to be what I get over time by you investing your life into other people, right? I have to determine, is reproducing you something that we're after? If I give you 25 people and I'm like, after a year, I'm going to have 25 more of you, is that the goal, right? We might have to be very honest about how we're planting and the desire for reproduction. We may have to be really honest. And it may have to bring us to more honest places in how we're considering leaders and then how we're entrusting leaders with relational influence. If we do not get excited about their life being reproduced in others. And it's made it a whole lot slower than what I thought. Um, but it's okay. Because I've realized that God has been patient with me in my own journey. Um, and that if I were God, I would have walked away from me a long time ago. <laughs> Thank God I am not. Uh, because he's not like me. And it's what continues to change my life. Um, you're actually nothing like me. And I'm glad. Um, and it's why it's good news. Because it's about him. And it's not about whoever the leader is. Because the leader isn't necessarily the goal, even though we're talking about leaders bearing relational influence. The leader and a vision of the leader is not the goal. It's the vision of the leader's life surrendered to God. It's not just follow me. It's follow me as I follow Christ. Right? Our vision is bigger than our own life. Our vision is bigger than our own influence, even though God will use that. Right, right. So we're not necessarily like shying away from leadership because there, there's things on both sides of the fence. Right. So we're not shying away from it in an unhealthy way. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, don't look at me. No, no. At times we have to look at something. We have to find someone who's modeling what it is that God wants. Right. This is the way that God has done it. He did it with Cain and Abel. Right? Like, God's mercy to Cain was Abel's life. I've already put a brother in your life who's living the way that I desire. Just look at him and learn from him. Model your life after his. Don't just keep bringing me what you want. Learn what I want. Well, how do I do that, Lord? I've already put somebody in your life who can call you higher. I've already put somebody in your life who can answer the cry of your heart, right? This is where relational influence and how interconnected and how interested in relationship God is, right? Ephesians 2 language, our lives knit together, creating a habitation for God himself by his spirit, right? A lot of times we cry out for something and God answers us by sending someone. Well, Lord, I want more. Okay, awesome. Into your life walks someone who's living and modeling the more that you've been crying out for. Well, no, 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 I don't want it that way. 
I just want you to do it for me personally. <laughs> that ain't how it works. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, no, 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 I'd rather just, you, you just, you answer me without me having to actually, like, deal with other people. No, no, that, that's, that's not how it goes. You know what I'm saying? The mercy of God to Cain was Abel's life. You know what I mean? But because Cain didn't want to learn through the relational influence that came off the life of a brother, he rather assassinate him than be convicted by him. Right? Like, at times, uh, we are trying to get away from people that convict us. Yeah. Even though they're the mercy of God and the way that he's trying to answer the cry of our heart. Come on. Well, getting around you makes me uncomfortable. Okay, that's cool. God's trying to answer like the cry of your heart. Rather than Cain dealing with that, he'd rather kill his brother than be conformed by him. It's easier for me to kill him than to let his life conform mine. Right? So, so the idea is disciples make disciples, but we are a disciple. We don't graduate from discipleship, right? We're like, well, you don't understand. Like, I'm a leader, bro. Like, I've got influence. Like, I'm semi-important. <laughs> we would never say these things because it just sounds so ridiculous. But the way we live says wow. these things, Come on. whether we actually communicate them or not, mm -hmm. right? Like, we never graduate from discipleship. So we're always a disciple, but disciples should be making disciples. So we're always being discipled and discipling. Mm -hmm. Because our lives bear influence the same way that others do. And as leaders, we should be committed to our own growth in God. You don't get to delegate that to somebody else. <laughs> like, you have to own your own growth journey in God. Wow. Come on. That's the idea of leadership. Right? Because then relational influence in the lives of others is trying to bring them to the place where they're willing to own their own growth journey in God. Which at times is a whole lot harder than just how simple that sounds. Right? It's very difficult sometimes to get people to want to own their own journey. To want to own and be responsible for their own maturity in God. Um, but as a leader, we are relationally responsible to lay our life down as a pattern and then influence others unto our way of life in God. This is the idea of leadership. I'm not just trying to teach you new tricks. I'm trying to teach you how to set your life up. Right? Like, like all these little tricks and all these little like external behavioral things that, that can be absolutely disconnected from a quality of real life in God, that's not the goal, right? It's not a traveling circus. You know what I'm saying? We're not trying to set up a local circus either. Like where we just have a bunch of performers who do ministry and others rally around and applaud. That's not the goal. Where we're disconnected from real life as a pattern getting laid down in the midst of a kingdom family or a covenant community. But where God is establishing patterns of real people that get laid down in kingdom family, covenant community, local church, mm -hmm. through that pattern and the influencing and the rallying of others unto the cultivating of a way of life in God, that is the goal. And that's why I say our church planting strategy is follow us. I'll just be honest, I don't believe the Lord ever asked me to plant a church. I couldn't confidently tell you that that's the invitation that I heard. Mm. What I do know is the Lord said, I've made you something. And I'm asking you to lay down your life in the midst of a community. And you laying down your life in the midst of a community mm. is going to relationally influence and cultivate that way of life in others. And as a kingdom, family, a covenant community, I will build my church. Mm. But that's up to me. That's not up to you, right? Because we can build church a whole lot of other ways. There's a whole bunch of other ways that you can build church other than the ultimate desire to lay your life down to see your way of life cultivated in others. But that's, that's the biblical prescription. 
right? Like, like that's the biblical prescription, which is why Paul said, follow me as I follow him, which is why in Acts 2, you say yes to Jesus, you now say yes to a way of life. That was the idea. This way of life actually produces a certain type of people that Jesus calls witnesses. And there are those who from within the ranks of that family are going to grow to places of maturity to be able to influence and develop the lives of others. We would call those leaders. But leaders in a family context lay their lives down to serve those that are younger and weaker than they are. That's why I have authority in my house. Not because I have the title of a dad, but because I have now for years and years tried my absolute best to wield that authority unto serving God's desires for the others that I know I'm responsible for. That's what gives me real authority. It's what creates kingdom influence, not because I tell people what to do, right? Because compliance is different than surrender, right? In relationship, you can bring people to places of compliance where they just do what you want them to do, right? Like, oh man, I really don't like these aspects of my job, but I got to do them because I don't want to get fired. You know what I'm saying? Like, so the motivation for compliance can be a variety of things. But surrender is an altogether different idea. Surrender is a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. I may do what you want me to do, but willingly, joyfully giving you my heart and surrendering my life, that's a whole different idea. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the idea of developing influence over time, um, we don't force people to submit. <coughs> that's strange. <coughs> <coughs> Right? Like, like, it's really strange. Because it's not a corporation. It's true. Right? Like, I don't force you to submit or else you're going to get fired. I couldn't fire one of my kids from the family. <laughs> do, do you get what I'm saying? Like, like I can't fire one of my kids because they didn't clean their room. Right? Like, like, that's not the idea of leading and bearing influence and authority in a covenant community or in a kingdom family. The idea is we're not firing anybody. Right now, I know that that's contrasted at times with people, right? Like in 1 Corinthians 6, where uh, I think Paul's encouragement is the guy who's sleeping with his dad's wife. Not the idea of his mom. That'd be really weird. It's his dad's wife. And he's like, pagans don't even act like this. He's like, put him out. So that he could repent. Right? Like, like the ultimate consequence is still unto the desire for repentance. Yes. The ultimate consequence is not firing him altogether, yeah. but it's putting him in a scenario where the pressure of the consequences that he's now having to deal with would bring him yeah. to the place where his heart would be softened back to the Lord, which therefore would bring him back into the house. Come on. Yeah. Because he does leave the 99 to go after the one. But he also puts out the one for the sake of the 99. Wow. So it's what brings balance. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the idea, again, is our lives bear influence. And an unrepentant, rebellious brother who is blatantly endorsing in sin and the enjoyment of it is going to influence those that he's relating to. Mm -hmm. But even the consequence of such is unto the desire for repentance to bring him back which is to serve God's desires, right? So bearing leadership authority has to look like kingdom and not like culture. It has to. But we really have to discover the person of God for ourselves in order to learn what he's like and then become students of what he's already said maturity looks like in the scriptures so that we're at least gauging it correctly. Mm -hmm. And then fully giving ourselves to that. Um, and that's not as easy as it sounds. And it takes time. You know, which is why um, I'm okay with things not being as instant and on demand as our culture would prescribe. Uh, because certain things I've realized take time in God. And you can't bypass certain time frames. Right? It's why you can consider two people's lives. Right? Because time alone is not the only 
uh, thing that matters. It's why you can have two people. Um, let's say somebody who's been in God for 30 years. What does that actually mean? Mm. Well, what does it mean? It could mean a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean that it means a lot. Mm. It could, though. 30 years doesn't mean, as a consequence, a certain level of maturity. It doesn't. It, it doesn't at all. So it, it doesn't matter, which is why I said, even for me, two decades, 20 years, that could mean something. It doesn't necessarily mean that it does, but it could. But there have to be other ways that we evaluate it. Because time alone, how somebody can perform, it, meaning externally with all of these different you know, ministry activity type things, none of those things actually are the evidence of a real maturity in being conformed to the image of Jesus. Because we can behave like him, but behaving like him doesn't always mean we become like him. The wow. two are different. Wow. Behaving does not always imply becoming. But if you're becoming, the consequence of becoming will always be behaving. Always. But you can learn how to do a lot without actually being transformed. Which is why I make the distinction between the two ideas. You can just learn to do a lot of stuff and not necessarily have it be from a transformed life. So behaving is not the only goal. And it can't be the only thing that we use to qualify leaders. Becoming, which implies real character. Christ-like character forged over time and tested over time. And the testing element is very important. Anyone who desires to be a leader, they first have to be tested. And having held on to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, then let them serve. The idea is we've watched them relationally and circumstantially, and they're the real deal. You can trust them. Their life has substance. They just haven't learned a bunch of ministry tricks. They're not trying to fake it till they make it. Their life is the real deal. God has done something in them. The grace of God is evident unto the place of transformation. They bear real fruit. Galatians 5, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, fruit. It's been evidenced as their life has been observed and measured. That's testing. They've been tested over time. Now they can serve. Which means now I can confidently tell other people because relationally and circumstantially you've been put through fire. And now, because we've observed you and you've held on to the mystery of the faith and come through above reproach, now you can relationally influence others and we can consider you an under-shepherd. To be trusted to be a servant shepherd in the lives of those that God considers to be his flock. This whole paradigm for leadership is very different than the business model. Come on the CEO of a ministry company driven structures that we have. This is not CEOs of ministry companies. We're not local corporations. This is a covenant community. It's a kingdom family, the local church. And we need fathers, mothers, we need servant shepherds. That's the idea of relational influence. Under, not undermining, <laughs> but under and yielding to the chief shepherd himself. Uh, because again, in the idea of leadership, we don't have a people. He does. They're not mine, they're his. I don't have a church. He does. And he said he would build it if I gave myself to the design that he prescribed. And that's what I want. I don't want to build it myself. I'm not the face of the franchise. He's the face of the franchise. He's the main event. He's the major attraction. He's the rallying point. He's the only one real enough beautiful enough to sustain everyone's efforts, attention, worship, like, like he's it. And so we make him everything, and we model our lives after what we see in him, and then he brings others around us so that we can lay our lives down for them and try to cultivate our way of life to where they're influenced by it. This is church planting. That, that, that's at least what church planting should look like. Right? Um... Ooh. All right.
Um, I want to leave room for questions. Well, I have a question. Uh, would you share um, from your just your life and your life with God in the ministry, like? Uh, when we're talking about character development and becoming men and women of character and integrity, what helped you the most in your walk with God? Now that you look back in the 20 years that you've been walking with God, what's, what's been most influential in your walk with God? Wow, so um, I, I think I think something that helped me early on was not trying to create some five or ten year vision of what I wanted my life to look like. Mm -hmm. That's um, because here and again, I could create a ten year goal, right, a five year goal, whatever, and find a bunch of ways to make that happen. But even if that happens, it doesn't always mean that I followed the path of yes to get there. You know, it doesn't mean that I did it his way. It doesn't mean that I yielded to him, that I let him have his way in me, that what he wanted from me, I made sure, and when I say I made sure, you get what I'm saying? Like, I made sure that, man, anything you want from me, I want you to have it. Like, I'm going to say yes to you, and I'm going to let that yes form the path. Um, I think something that helped me early on was not trying to come up with some five-year vision. But, but really, more than that, having a jealousy to cultivate a yes to God in every moment. Because for me, what I learned was, is if I can cultivate a now yes, it will, as a byproduct, put me where I need to be five years from now. But I can five years from now end up where I thought I wanted to be and have it not be conditioned by saying yes to God at all. Wow. Like, like at all. Um, and then part of, part of character forming is having the vision tested. You know, so that's not to say that we don't have some idea of what destiny means for us. We do. Um, you know, God has a dream for all of our lives. And even right getting radically born again, coming out of um, you know, drug addiction, gang life, jail time, all this crazy stuff, like broken home, expulsion from school, uh, like, like whatever, all, all of disease, you know, like uh, sickness, um, all of this stuff. Like coming out of that, getting radically wildly born again, um, God like deposited in my heart like a vision of days that I feel like in a lot of ways I'm living in fulfillment right now of things that God showed me in the early stages of just getting born again right so we all carry some sort of dream some sort of idea right of what God is longing to accomplish through partnership with us right through Joseph's life he gets a dream in the beginning and the dream in the beginning actually creates the process for him right where the vision gets right. tested well, this is crazy because now my life doesn't look anything like I feel like the, what God has spoken. Those have been some of the most defining seasons yeah. of life for me. Mm -hmm. Where I've had to learn ultimate satisfaction in God. Because my idea of satisfaction at times can easily get tethered to or anchored in what I want from Him. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, like, well, I need this to be satisfied. Right? We can become like infatuated with destiny, which doesn't also mean that like we still have an ultimate obsession with him. Yeah. And then he gets used as an inroad to the things that we want, right? We can at times even like use God for things that God has said to us. Yeah. Right? So I, so I feel like for me, um, some of the, the best seasons, though, while I was going through them, I didn't really appreciate it because I was dying. <laughs> right. right? Like, 
I was dying yeah. and I was having to learn how to like die to self. And that's not to say that like I've graduated from that. I'm still <laughs> in all types of ways. The conversation in some ways never changes. Right. right? Like in some ways it never changes. No. Um, give more of yourself to me. Okay. Man, that's going to be my whole life, you know? Um, but in the idea of like testing character and forging character, um, the forging of ter character comes through the testing of character. And none of us really know how we're going to be tested or when we're going to be tested. If we did, we would always pass. So in most instances, you don't realize that you were being tested sometimes until after the test pass. Right? And now you're reflecting with the Lord on things that you've gone through and how you handled it. Right? But like, glory to glory, faith to faith, requires a certain level of graduating, which means testing well. Um, you know, and it's no different than like the normal ranking in school. Um, if you fail the second grade 14 years in a row... I get it just by due process. Sometimes they're like, hey, listen, we can't have a 21-year-old in the second grade. Like, like, bro, we're going to move you through. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to find other ways to kind of, like, push you through. That's not how the Lord works. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, if you get an F 57 times in a row, you still got an F. <laughs> wow. You know what I mean? You're going to have to test again. Mm -hmm. You know? So, so a lot of times when we talk about character forging, we talk about character testing. Mm -hmm. Because what I am has to be revealed or experienced in real time mm -hmm. so that God can tenderly rally alongside of me unto the place of my own development. It's like, hey, we need work here, you know? And so learning to, to grow in God, I can say, um, which is really going to bear the heart of what I said, like, you know, wanting to have a yes to him, is more and more learning to be satisfied with him and only him. Mm -hmm. Not him and something else. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, which requires seasons where that's going to be tested. Which is what Paul says in Philippians 4. I've learned through a variety of life seasons. I've had little and I've also had a lot. Right? Which is where we get this um, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Mm -hmm. Paul is talking about, I've been through life in a real way that has looked at times not what I wanted it to look like, but I've learned how to be faithful to him in places and seasons where it was really hard. He says, I've learned how to live with little places of suffering, sorrow. Mm. Like I've learned the opposite or seeming like polar extremes on both sides. I've done with little and I've done with a lot. He said, but I've learned the secret in the midst of it all is I can do all things because he's in me and he gives me strength. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, learning to be satisfied in him really is the grounds for the testing of our character. You know, because um, much of the things we think we want, they test us, which is what James says. He says you, you quarrel, you have all of these like fights with one another, right? Because you're provoked by the things that other people have and like the testing is in the place of your longings, <laughs> right? Because there are things that you want and you can't have them. You haven't found a way to get them. Others have them. Therefore, it provokes all of this jealousy and all of this, you know, relational stuff. It's like, no, no, no. He says you have not because you ask not. But even when you do ask, you ask with the wrong motive. Right? So, so much of our character testing comes from our longings. Um, and there's nothing that tests what we say we want greater than God setting up life in a way that we don't really get excited about. Wow. <laughs> wow. I said there's nothing that tests like our satisfaction in God and, and like the character development journey that we're on. That something that tests it in a great way is him setting up life in a way that we're not really excited about. <laughs> like, I don't like this at all. Okay. You know, like, like David with his great vision of being a king. Back out in the shepherd's field. You know, Joseph carrying this dream. 
sitting in a prison cell somewhere. I'm like, Lord, surely this can't be the way. Yeah. You know, so in, in my own life, I feel like I've had so many seasons where life didn't look like what I thought I wanted it to, mm -hmm. but that's what was being yeah. tested. Yeah. Is, are you really satisfied with me? Or is your idea of being satisfied with me, meaning I have to give you all the things you think you want? Mm -hmm. Because then that means the things you want are what satisfies you, and it's not really me. And the only way that we find that out is by testing that, by setting life up to where it seems like you don't have an access point to all the things you think you want, but you still have me. <laughs> and if I'm enough for you, then you can be satisfied in every season. You can be beautiful in every season. You know, I, I remember uh, working at Verizon and going out and sitting on the bench at times on my break time and just weeping before the wow. Lord. Right now, this is like multiple six-figure salary, like nationally recognized, all of this crazy stuff. And I'd go out and sit on a bench on break time and just weep before the Lord. And I would say, like, Lord, I know you've put something on my life, and it's not being best demonstrated here. Um, you know, and then in that season, because again, God will only hold you accountable for what he's revealed to you. Wow. Wow. Like, like, you can't be held accountable for revelation that you don't have ownership of. Wow. Right? But... but that's where revelation becomes difficult because now you are held responsible for things that have been revealed. Right? Which is why James says not many of us should desire to be teachers because you'll be held to a more strict judgment. Right? He's saying the accountability on those of us that actually have ownership of revelation and then to influence others unto certain goals or objectives. Um, you know, so in those days, I thought that like the ultimate mountaintop experience of life was to work at the church. It was like, I've not arrived until I could land some sort of staff position at the church. And whether intentionally or unintentionally, everyone was being indoctrinated to believe that. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. whether it was being said directly or not was irrelevant because the way that everyone behaved and then the other language and encouragements all shaped that belief system, right? Um, you weren't really doing anything for the Lord unless you were working at the church, yeah. right? Like, if you had to be in business, then that's what you did until you could land a staff position, um, right? Which is why I remember, you know, uh, making $300,000 a year and getting invited to come be a youth pastor for $32,000 and, like, joyfully quitting my job and running to the church so that I could feel important. Right? Like, th there was no one in that season to actually disciple me correctly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Again, like, according to a system. Um, but I think, like, I I've just had so many different seasons where satisfaction in God is what was being tested, and it brought about all of the tests of character in a variety of ways. You know, whether that was working... 60, 70 hours in construction, house to house, day by day, swinging a hammer, working with a drill, dying every day. Um, construction's hard work, right? Like, just asking the Lord, like, what is going on? Like, how does this fit at all wow. in what you've said to me? Mm. Like, what? is happening um, and being tested by that day by day. Like, can you be faithful to this? And in being faithful to this, you're being faithful to me. Right? Like, loving me well looks like you being faithful to this. Yeah. You know? Um, and I just think season to season, all of the, the configurations of testing have a unique way of changing. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, we can't master the testing field because God is constantly shifting the pieces yeah. to bring up certain things in us that are going to expose what needs to be exposed so that, um, because he's a good father, 
and he's a good shepherd, he can rally alongside of us in tender, loving care and help us along the way. Um, the goal is never to like shame you, right? Like create distance from you through exposing you. It's just not how he is. Um, you know, but with, with character, I just think God has a million ways yeah. to form our lives, but it all hinges on yes. Right? Like, like all of it. Because the things he's after, he has a beautiful way of setting up situations and de designing seasons of life in order to get what it is that he wants. Right? And some of the seasons that I've not appreciated the most, reflectively looking back, have been the most influential mm -hmm. in my development. Mm -hmm. But while walking through it, I didn't appreciate it at all, and I hated it, and I was mad, and I tried to pray prayers to like pray my way out of the season that I was in, you know, where I thought, like, man, if I just pray the right prayer, God will get me out of this. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> like, he's not trying to get you out of something he designed. Let's go. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like, Lord, I love you, and even if my life looked like this for the rest of my life, I would love you, and I would be satisfied here. That's not true at all. So I'm just going to let that extend a little bit longer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're the one that's just trying to pray that, thinking that, like, that's going to be the genie prayer that, like, shifts you into your next season. Like, bro, you, you don't mean that. But, but you may be deceived, and you may think you mean that. But I'm going to let it carry over long enough to where you know that you don't really mean that. Because I know that you don't mean that. Wow. Right? So I'm going to let this extend long enough to where you finally come to the point where you're like, I didn't mean that at all because I hate this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and I've been trying to pray my way out of this thinking that if I told you I was satisfied, you'd believe me and move me on to the next one. It's like, no, it's just not how it works. Uh, For real, it's just not how it works. You know? Um, and so I've had to be confronted with the condition of my own heart, which has, in many ways, caused me to grow up in God. Um, because you can't make progress from an imaginary place. Whoa. Right? Like, we actually have to define what reality is. Um, That's crazy. No, there's just been so much of it. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Of course. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You, I mean, you kind of partially... <laughs> that was just so funny. You kind of partially answered this when you answered your question. But, well, yeah, while I was like formulating the question, Ron, you're like answering it. I'm like, oh, that's funny. But you, you kind of talked about how you, when you're in the season of the mundane nothingness that God has to put you through to make you what you supposedly want to be, you you don't usually enjoy it, but is there a way to like, or have you learned to like train yourself to catch yourself when you're in it, to see what's going on, and to actually embrace it and love it? Um, yeah, because yeah. I know it's easier once you're out of it, but is there a way to like, kind of like, like, you know, once you're out of the forest, you you know, you're not seeing just trees and you can see everything. You're like, oh, that was like, that was a Joseph prison season. Praise God. Mm -hmm. But how do you, yeah, love it when you're in it and learn to identify it when you're in it? So I think we were talking about this on the way over. 15, 20 years ago, I would not have been able to handle what my life looks like right now. Mm -hmm. Me personally. I would have been a mess in the middle of trying to keep together all of the responsibilities that God has entrusted me with. Um, whereas, just, just meaning like all of what my life looks like in a personal and a public way. Um, 15, 20 years ago, I would have been a mess. Mm -hmm. Meaning like my quality of life in God. I would have been a train wreck trying to keep up, trying to perform well, trying to make sure that like I met the moment and you know all of this. I would have been a mess mm -hmm. because I didn't actually have the fortitude in God and the simple confidence that like my day by day in the way that I give to him is what's actually readying me for any of the responsibility or exposure that he may entrust me with, right? When I say God is not like us, um, 
one of the things that we can do is you can look at the life of John the Baptist, right? It, looking at the life of John the Baptist, we find out that God goes really big in ways that the world considers really small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God gives himself in an extraordinary way to the mundane, mm -hmm. to the day by day. He goes all in in things that nobody else gets to see. Right? John lived in obscurity, hiddenness, like really like the, the way of the wilderness as it was for John. And John gave an extraordinary effort into what many others would consider to be an insignificant way of life. Right. Yeah. John for 30 years, right? I mean, maybe not, whatever, decades, gave himself, when he had the opportunity to be a part of the religious system, to have all of the, the fancy luxuries of life. He had a way to be a part of that, right? Zechariah being his father, one of the priests serving in the temple. He had a way to be a part of that, but the voice of God led him out. And his life of like obscurity and perceived insignificance. God readied the man that would set the stage for the revealing of his son through obscurity and insignificance. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? By going really big in what everyone else considered to be really small. Like, God readied a man who, who is a pattern in himself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like John is a prototype mm -hmm. of the people at the end of the age that will ready the stage for the reveal. Right? That sense of embarrassment comes from being more conscious of what other people think. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that, that sense of, like, the fear of man that's alive on the inside. Like, like, that's where that feeling of being embarrassed comes from. Right? But when you know who you are, it doesn't really matter anymore. Right? And he's like, the only reason you can't do this is because you don't know who you are yet. But we're going to get there. Right? And hopefully as we journey together, you'll realize more and more and therefore be free enough to do anything. And find joy and purpose in every single part of life and every season or process, you know, that, that we come through. Um, so, so I think it just takes like, you know, like the, the Romans 12, um, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to think different. And the spirit empowers that, right? Which is 1 Corinthians 2. Like we have access to the mind of Christ. So the spirit is jealously reconfiguring our thoughts where we bring every thought subject to Christ, right? And we make it obedient to him. Which means we don't want to be thinking things that he's not going to be willing to amen. <laughs> right? Like we want our thoughts to be so unified with who he is and how he thinks that he wouldn't say, no, 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 I can't amen that thought. You know, which is why we have to bring it obedient to him. And which is why we have to take thoughts captive sometimes. You know? Uh, but I think it just takes like a, a, a reconfiguring, a transforming of the way we think. So that we can see ourselves and our whole life different. So you mean summarize a whole book into like a three or four minute answer? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I wrote a book on that, you know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Did you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, yeah, for me, like, like rest is vital in the life of a believer. Right? Like everything about the way our culture sets up life tells us to grind so that we can rest. Mm -hmm. To strive 
so that we can rest. Because again, we tend to associate him being present with certain things, which in a lot of cases doesn't have anything to do, right? Like the volume of the music, how excited a couple of people get, right? Like, like whatever, all of that stuff, right? Like it's always been interesting to me. Like we leave a gathering and you're like, bro, oh, God was there. What made you think that? You know what I'm saying? So, so again, in, in the simplicity of simply wanting to engage him and then grow in like the conditioning of my attentiveness to him. I feel like where I am right now is he's kind of asked me like, remove all the other stuff. And this is onto something. Remove all the other stuff and I want to be found, right? So it's not like, come find me. It's like, he already wants to be found. So that's at least helpful. Um, once engaged, like an attentive, I can then be led. Because that's really what I want time with him to look like, is him leading, right? So out of that place, that may lead to a directive to, yeah, pray in the spirit. That may lead to a directive to like, man, invest myself in these passages in the word. That may lead to a directive um, you know, like for the the inclusion of like, man, worship music or, you know, whatever, ambient sounds and you know, whatever, all, all of that, that may be a part of it. But that stuff for me in this season is not what's primary. In this season, what's primary is finding him and then letting him lead my heart. Um, and sometimes his leading is just to try and gaze as long as my heart will allow. Like, as long as my heart will allow. And I say that because we find out very quickly how bored we get with God. Which is why I'm saying this other stuff at times is not really helping as much as we think it's helping. It's just hiding our boredom with Him as a person. Right? We're like, now to feel good about my devotional efforts, I'm going to cover up my lack of satisfaction and boredom with who you are. Right? And I know we use like these creatures and elders and angels all the time, like from the moment they saw him. I mean, like we're talking about winged creatures with eyes without and within that have sung the same song from the very time they were able to lay eyes on him. Like, God is not boring. If we're getting bored with God, it's because we are boring. <laughs> like, God is not bored. I mean, like, thrown on a crystal sea, fire and lightning constantly exuding out of his throne. Like, his face is radiant. His eyes are literally burning. Creatures that, like, no reference point in the world for. Gathering around him, singing psalms. Elders casting crowns, like, man, a vision, like a heavenly throne room vision. If that's not enough to satisfy a gaze in an unending way for the rest of our life, the issue's on our side, right? It's definitely on our side. He is captivating. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, if we're not captivated by what we're finding in the devotional place, in the secret place, are we actually finding it? Right, like rising from the secret place, like, well, that was boring. Well, was he there? What did you go in looking for? What did you actually touch? What did you find? What did you invest into? Like, you know, all of these things. So for me, in this, bro, I've had seasons where it's been all kinds of different stuff. Um, you know, um, yeah, I think I explained it. Where the emphasis has kind of like majored on different things, and it was right in those seasons, right, because he was leading that. Um, but just where I am right now is men trying to sit and linger longer in the place of gazing and being attentive, and then out of that, whenever he leads, he leads. But even if the whole time is just that, um, that's okay for me because he's enough for me, you know. Um, and then it's important to say, 
outside of that, there are other spaces in my life where I am giving myself to worship and the studying of the word and things of that nature. I'm talking about a specific early rising time that I've devoted to gazing and being led. And if other things are included in that, cool, but even if it's just whatever the time period is, lingering in the place of gazing, that's what's satisfying. You know, because I am disciplined in other ways with the other stuff, which I, I should include. You said you had a second question. Can I ask it? <laughs> it's a good short version. Well, so like you're talking about um, some I really desire to under You guys have been for how long doing like your community at the Father's House? Like six, seven years. Oh. Like that. It, it depends on what you consider the starting point. Six or seven years. Yeah. Okay, so I'd love to hear from you guys like six, seven years. You know, I'm talking about like Noah, 100 years and only seven people coming out of that. You guys, six, seven years and not, it slowed you guys down. Um, but the intentionality that I've seen from you guys for that, you know, since I've known you guys. Um, and never wavering from that. What has that done? Like, what's the fruit of that in terms of your guys' relationships with each other? What it's done to, like, essentially kind of, like, help set you guys free and bring you guys into, like, connection and, like, authentic um, interpersonal, like, relationships, like the two of you and, like, with John. I don't know how close you are with John still. Oh, yeah. Like, what, what it, yeah, what's the fruit of that, you know? Yeah, I think bleeding together does something to form a bond that other things just don't do. Yeah. Um, it's not because we have the same personal interests. You're not going to get two more different people <laughs> than, than Steve and I. Um, different in every possible, like, personal way. Right, but that's the power of the gospel, is it conquers our personal preferences. Mm -hmm. Right, we're not only like relating to people that are like us. Right, we're like, well, we gotta have the same number of kids or we can't hang out. We gotta like the same sports team or like we can't be friends. Like we gotta like the same styles of food. No. All of this is like lower level places of connection. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's worldly stuff. Defining the terms by being able to evaluate one another that way. All of these distinctions and ways we identify and like subcategorize, that belongs to the world. Right? We are now a Jesus people. So that brings us all together. Right? Like no longer defined by, you know, ethnicities or, you know, uh, whatever. Social culture and status and things like that. Um, you know, but I say that because like bleeding together does something to form a bond in God that other things don't. Um, you know, really like in an ongoing way, continuing to lay your life down for the Lord in covenant loyalty and then for others in covenant loyalty yes. does something to forge relationship. Um, and again, you, you can have language in the beginning, but only time mm. makes the substance of what you know how to say real. Um, you know, and that, that's like for us. Which, I mean, I'll just share one more thing, and then, you know, whatever uh, Steve has to share. Um, I think in the time that we've been journeying, we've had more people leave our church than become a part of our church. Yeah. And it's been cool, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, it's wow. been super cool, actually. Wow. Um, in the first two years... We probably had between two to 250 people that came through yeah. in different cycles yeah. like this. Like, well, I, oh man, like I heard that like they're planting something. We're going to come check it out for a couple of weeks. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to come and like see what they're up to. And, you know, we're going to stick around for a month or two and then be like, oh wait, oh no, like this is what y'all are really doing. Like, okay, yeah, I didn't want this. Or like, you know, come, it, so like in the first couple of years, like, probably between two to 250 people came through and left. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning, it was difficult because we knew what we were after. And so in that, we knew what we were aspiring to be. Like God had given us a vision and we were going for it. We were going to lay down our lives for the Lord and each other to really like go after what God had shown us. But even though we knew who we wanted to be, we didn't know who we weren't. And 
that created a lot of issues, right? Because sometimes you know who you are, but you just don't know who you aren't. Mm. And so you end up spending a lot of time catering and making accommodations wow. for other people's desires and demands and like what they want you to be, what they thought this was going to look like, how they wanted all of the relational things to work out. And you spend a lot of time trying to be things that you're not Dang. that are ending up taking a lot of time from you being refined into what you're supposed to be. Wow. And so one of the most like profound things that happened to us was the season when we learned what we weren't. Because mm. it didn't happen right away. It took some time. Um, and when we learned what we weren't, everything changed. I feel like the level of conviction changed for all of us on the inside. Because again, in the beginning, we were just trying to do our best. And we were learning and trying to grow. And we were trying to do it together. Um, but when we learned what we weren't, it was like, oh, okay, cool. I don't have to try to be that for you anymore. God's not asking me to be that. So I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't even have to spend a lot of time trying to like debate you on why I'm not willing to entertain being that. Um, you know, because again, in a variety of ways to build, um, in certain ways, we are not the most attractional model. We're, we're, but I'm not trying to be an attractional model. And I'm not trying to be seeker sensitive. <laughs> because the person who's coming isn't my primary focus. Mm. He is. And what I'm building, I'm building for him. I'm not building it for you. <laughs> Which is why you are not first in my thinking. It's not for you. It's for him. Right? So I'm not trying to build what my city wants. Because it's not for my city. It's for him. But my city has a certain sway to it. And if I'm not careful, I can be caught up in the sway of my city and build it. Because I know that if I build it according to the sway of the city, it'll produce certain results. But again, I'm not building it for the city. It's for him. I'm not building it so that other Christians in my city are going to like it. Because <laughs> they're not my primary concern. And once we learned like what we weren't, it was so helpful in refining and making crystal clear a greater conviction unto what we knew God asked us to be. And I feel like it really gave us a place to be way more intentional because things got way more simple. Like, he gave us a blueprint. It's a way of life together. And so we were able to be more committed to what we already knew he had given us in simplicity without trying to complicate it with a bunch of other stuff that he wasn't asking us to be. Like, he wasn't asking us to do those things. But for the sake of wanting to cater to other people's ideas and opinions and dreams and goals and wanting to pull it all in a bunch of different directions, we had this happening all the time. But now we know what we are. And I'm not coming off it, like, for anybody. You know what I mean? The plan is the plan. The vision is the vision. And what he said to us is what we're laying our life down for. And, and it's very freeing. And so those of us that have been like battle tested, like we've paid a price together for what it is that the Lord has asked us for. And it has formed a certain level of relationship because again, like bleeding together on behalf of God's purposes. So I grew up as a military kid, right? So my dad was in the Air Force and I spent my whole life being surrounded by people that had a level of camaraderie that was way different than anything I had ever seen in the world. Way different. And they had all subscribed to a vision that even if it cost them their life, they were willing to pay the ultimate price. And that did something. Like when you bump into people, saying, in the military, that have been in the military, there's a certain level of camaraderie that it's just, it's unexplainable. But we see that in a lot of places, right? It's like playing on the same championship sports team and then going separate ways. You find each other later in life, it's like, you remember the price that we paid and the bond that we formed and what actually happened in the place of relationship? Um, but the kingdom offers a better and a greater vision than anything the world has ever seen. Right? Kingdom vision is better than military vision. Kingdom vision is better than some championship sports team. 
Kingdom vision is better than the vision that Coca-Cola gets everybody to subscribe to. You know what I mean? Kingdom and like King Jesus has offered us a vision that is more extraordinary than anything the world has ever known or experienced. And so bleeding on behalf of kingdom vision with a group of people does something to us. And it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Where you pay a price and you battle it out. Because what I'm not saying is that it's easy. And what I'm not saying that there's never been things that we've had to enter, kind of relate to one another on, um, and choose to love one another and continue to lay our lives down for each other. Uh, even against, at times, our own feelings of not wanting to do that. Right? We're like, man, I had to pray a long time. And God really had to do something to me so that I could purely move forward the way that we move forward. Right? Like a lot of times people see you in what you're doing, but they don't understand everything that it took for you to get there. Like, hey, I'm coming to actually repent and ask for forgiveness. Oh, bro, that's amazing. Like, I think it's so cool that you would do something like that. Yeah, yeah. Before you get super impressed, you don't understand that it took me seven months of fasting and praying to actually get here. Because I really wanted to stab you in the eyeballs for a long time. <laughs> you know? But like, but God had to do something to me so that I could actually come and do what I'm doing. You know? Um, so that's why I say, like, man, in the, like, in all the interdynamics of life, I just think that now we've got a group of us that have paid a price over time together. And we now, because we made a decision at some point when we realized what we weren't, we made a decision to get in the ark together. Like we're going to get in the ark together and we're going to close the door. Not to become a cult, but we're going to close the door on like all of the other ideas of what people want us to be. We're going to close the door and we're going to give ourselves with greater intentionality to an intimate place of proximity and power and presence together to become what God like is asking us to do.